So this is the Gospel of Luke. Now, Matthew, we, we've already talked about this, but Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah and the King of Kings, uh, the King of the Jews, if you will. Mark uh, proves that he is the servant. We looked at that last week. And then Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man, if you will, the servant. Um, the Son of Man, and I, I, I have to be... I have to apologize. I just really had a good time looking up all the the places where the Son of Man is used, and so I, I, I filled a paragraph here with that. Anyhow, it first was uh, in Numbers, then Job and Psalms and Isaiah and Jeremiah, but the biggest use is in Ezekiel. Uh, Daniel only a couple of times. New Testament, Matthew uses it 32 times, Mark 15, and Luke then uses it 26. In the Gospel of John, uh, he uses it 12, Acts one time. Uh, Hebrews one time and Revelation twice. So uh, it's not an uncommon name whatsoever. So when Luke presents him as the Son of Man, uh, he's presenting his manhood, if you will, that he is of man. And yet we also know that he is of God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So the important thing to remember that Matthew writes to the Hebrew mind, we've already talked about that, the Jewish mind, uh, Mark wrote to the Roman mind, if you will, those um, those Gentiles that were in that particular city. And Luke then writes to a different mind. He writes to the Greeks. Now, it, as we get into this, you're going to see that he writes at a different level, um, English-wise or Greek-wise or Aramaic-wise. He writes to a different level than does Matthew and Mark. And uh, so, therefore... His gospel contains a few things that the others do not. But it is the third of the synoptic gospels. And we've talked about synoptic before. And basically it means they're laid aside. In other words, you can read Matthew, you can read Mark, and read Luke. And almost all of it is very, very close. Different, looking from a different point of view. But Luke is the third one of those. Now, the gospel of Luke only mentions a Passover one time uh, as a child and then later uh, as an adult. Um, he also uh, lists the Passover with Jesus and his disciples. That's found in Luke chapter number 22. Well, the Gospel of John mentions three and maybe four of those um, uh, festivals, if you will. And you say, well, Bob, why is that important? Well, it kind of helps us again know that uh, Luke wasn't writing to the Jews where uh, Matthew was, and so was John. John was writing to all mankind, but he, he was very inclusive, if you will. So uh, the festivals were very important. So when we get into later into John, uh, we're going to find out that he writes uh, and shows all those festivals and has to explain some things because the people he's writing to uh, don't understand the Jewish festivals. So, But we'll see that when we get to it. So let's look at the author. Uh, the author of uh, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles is the same person. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, we know that because both of them were written to the same person, uh, and that is Theophilus. And we'll look at that in a moment as well. So the third Gospel does not identify who is really its author. Uh, the early church fathers uh, agreed that it was Luke uh, and that he was a doctor. Um, and um, that is kind of a given. And Luke also then wrote to wrote the Acts of the Apostles. Now, he wasn't a eyewitness, so where did he get all of his information? Well, most of his information he got from Paul. Um, I used a quote here from the ESV Study Bible. It says, The Lucan authorship of Luke and Acts is affirmed by both external evidence and also internal evidence. Church tradition supporting Luke as the author is both uh, early, early, early to mid second A.D., and unanimously, it's never doubted until the 19th century. Uh, most of that is because he uses we's and us and that type of thing when he's writing about that, specifically when he's writing about Paul and as a companion of Paul. Uh, so anyhow, you can read the rest of that. Basically, it just kind of gives you an idea of why. Uh, most uh, theologians agree that Luke, non, uh, non-apostle Luke, wrote the Gospel according to Luke as well as the Acts of the Apostles. Now, uh, Luke is the second of our Gospel writers that was not 
one of the original disciples. Now, when I say original disciples, remember I'm talking about the twelve. We know that there were many, 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 many disciples. And we know because of his age, uh, he probably was just a wee boy or a small boy or not even born yet when uh, Jesus was walking this earth. Um, he may have heard and may have met him, but we just don't know because, once again, we don't know who really the author is. Uh, although, historically and theologically, uh, it is believed that it is Luke who is the author. Luke's identified as a physician by Paul in Colossians chapter 4 and 14. Luke, the beloved physician, he says, and Demas greets you. So we get the idea that he is a physician. Uh, Luke's two books are addressed to the same person, Theophilus. We find that in Luke chapter 1 and 3, and also in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Um, well, Luke writes these two books. We know little about him. Luke does not refer to himself in the gospel, kind of like John doesn't refer to himself, which we'll see next week. So he doesn't really refer to himself. Uh, however, when he gets into his time where he is actually following along with Paul, then he uses the us and we's and them's that tie, uh, together. And that gives us the idea that he was not only a companion with him, but this is where he was getting his information. It's also believed that Luke was with Paul up until the time of his martyrdom. Uh, there was a movie that was made last year, and it was on Paul. And uh, anyhow, it shows Luke there and talking to Paul. And it, you know, I, I don't know how how correct that is, but we get the idea that that had to happen. And uh, anyhow, uh, Luke then mostly took the words of Paul and then created the gospel message. So what is the date then? Well, in general, it's best to look at both of them together, the Luke and Acts of the Apostles. They really, it, it really kind of is a shame that they were separated by the Gospel of John. It almost makes more sense to me that Matthew, Mark, and then John, and then Luke, and then the Acts of the Apostles, because as you read to the end of Luke, Acts just picks right up where Luke left off with the church triumphant, if you will. He writes about the church, and he writes about all the things that the apostles had done. So uh, that's really key. And when we get down to figuring out a date, uh, most figure it's somewhere between 60 and 70 AD. Uh, most accepted date is somewhere around 62 AD. Uh, and it's generally accepted that uh, it follows close along with the events that are happening in Acts chapter number 28. Now, if it is in fact uh, around, uh, the, go the gospel was written around 62 AD, then what that really means, it's uh, 30 years past uh, the time of Christ. Um, and so we don't know the age of Luke at this particular time, um, but uh, 62 seems like a good year. There's those who believe that both of the books were completed somewhere in the mid 60s, somewhere between 64 and 67. Uh, what was the reasoning for putting... Oh, oh okay. Um, I'm sorry. Debbie, uh, Danny, great question. The, the reason I said that to me it would have made more sense that the Gospels would have been Matthew, Mark, John, and then Luke, and then the Acts of Apostles is simply because if you read to the end of the Gospel of Luke and you begin the Acts of the Apostles, it's almost like uh, there was a commercial break and then Acts of the Apostles takes place. I'm not saying that's what it should be. I'm just saying for me, when I study it, that's how I study it. I study the book of Luke and then go right into Acts and then study John on his own. So thanks for the question there, uh, Danny. Um, so if we separate the two books, then, then you know, uh, it, we're still somewhere in the mid-60s when it was written. Uh, neither of these writings include the trial and the death of Paul, which is the last portion that happens in the Acts of the Apostles. That's basically the uh, leading up to that. Uh, uh, Luke does not include the persecution of Nero, which would happen somewhere around 65, and then finally the destruction of Jerusalem um, in AD 70. So none of that is covered in either the Gospel and or uh, the Acts of the Apostles. And I know I'm kind of already filling in some of the blanks when we get to the Acts of the Apostles, but they're so close together, we almost have to talk about them that way. Uh, while I've not yet you know, really done a completed search, a thorough research, uh, I, I'm pretty happy with just saying a mid-60s um, type of date for the writing of both or one of these books. 
it just makes sense because uh, the persecutions had not happened yet and also uh, it doesn't neither one of them talk about the death of Paul so to me I think that's good both Luke and Acts uh, document the spread of the gospel throughout the known world the Roman Empire uh, once the gospel reaches Rome Luke simply stops his writings we don't know why it just almost is uh, we have Paul at the very end of the Acts and all of a sudden then just nothing there writing and uh, so it's hard to know why he just simply stopped uh, maybe he died uh, don't know uh, Luke presents his gospel what is the purposes and content of it Luke presents his gospel primarily to non-Jewish readers and Greeks he presents Jesus as the Son of Man Jesus favorite title for himself now there are a lot of really great passages in Luke and since Luke is a doctor uh, he includes some things that the others perhaps would not but there are some important passages and let's just look at those just for a moment um, the account of the birth of Christ now his account is much deeper than the account that we find in the Gospel of Matthew uh, the testimony of God to his son we find in chapter 3 and verse 21 and 22 the announcement of Jesus as the anointed one in chapter 4 verses 16 to 24 uh, the mission of the Son of Man is found in later in the book in 19 and verse 10 um, Jesus prayer life he shows a lot of his prayer life in 321 516 612 through 16 he he documents those for us and then finally uh, Jesus teaching by parables now he lists uh, three there uh, and if we were going to look at a general statement about uh, where this was uh, as a whole then uh, Luke's gospel really concentrates on Jesus's Galilean ministry now we know that um, his childhood he was raised uh, we don't know much about it but we know that when he was baptized he went into a time of testing and then after that then we have his Galilean ministry and really um, Luke really concentrates on that most of the material is in the northern part then of Galilee and uh, if we were going to just run a quick uh, four-point bullet point if you will outline it would be the bullet point number one uh, from chapter one all the way through chapter four and verse 13 would be the nativity his boyhood and then the manhood of Jesus remember we just don't know a lot about Jesus until he starts his ministry years uh, then chapters 4 through 9 uh, really talk about his ministry in Galilee and then his trip from uh, Jerusalem or trip down to Jerusalem uh, covers a lot this is where um, Luke really chronicles a lot of the um, important things that happened to Christ for example some of the healings and some of the activities that happen and you can see that's ten whole chapters I mean that's that's a large portion of the book that was dedicated just from his going from Galilee down to Jerusalem and then finally his passion or his sacrifice and then his triumph uh, you can see there uh, Luke handles that in almost five five chapters if you remember from last week Mark just jumps right to the end and he doesn't cover the final week very long he doesn't cover the the uh, the resurrection very much and then he's just done but Luke here and he, he covers it in a, you know basically another five chapters so what are this some of the parables and teachings that are found only in the gospel of Luke well there's the lost portion so um, Luke uh, chapter 15 we call that the lost chapter uh, but there's a lost money and then there's a prodigal son now that's where you're going to get the information on the prodigal son it's important for you to know that if you want to go look at the prodigal son well uh, Luke is the one who includes that and also then Luke includes the rich man and Lazarus that very famous um, conversation that happens uh, between the rich man and um, and Abraham so um, the rich man wants some things but uh, Lazarus is in uh, Abraham's bosom and he's comforted and cared for and the rich man was not well that is found later in Luke chapter number 16 and uh, verses 19 through 31 so uh, when I look at the central message then of uh, of this gospel um, 
I think it's important that we understand that while he wrote to the Greeks, uh, he knew that his audience was going to be some Jews and he was going to have some Gentiles, uh, and therefore uh, his his whole goal was to show that Jesus was the promised one of God, much like Matthew, uh, as the Messiah, that as uh, prophesied in the Old Testament, and it's attested to God's saving ability that's only through the life of Jesus Christ, um, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, Luke is emphasized uh, the faithfulness of the Christian traditions of his readers had been taught so that they, by le uh, believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, they would receive the promised Holy Spirit whom he gives to all who would follow him. Now, that is a quote from, once again, the ESV uh, study Bible. Um, anyhow, I just wanted to throw that in there so that you can see that point of view. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it's almost to me as this would be the theme verse, if there was. But the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So this, this one simple verse covers in, the importance of uh, Luke's Gospel. And if Luke's Gospel was written to Greeks, it would be important for them to understand the Son of Man. Now, the Greeks were always looking for that perfect human. They were always looking, you know, much like we do in today's society. Um, I just was reading something today where some magazine selected the most uh, handsome man of the year and that kind of thing. You know, it's kind of our society. We're always looking for that really primo person, whoever it may be. Well, so were the Greeks. They, they, are, they were very philosophical. They, uh, they searched out uh, perfection. They searched out uh, education. And so, therefore, by showing that Jesus is the Son of Man, which would be a human form, but God, uh, that pricked some of their interest, and therefore it helped them to understand the importance of Jesus as the anointed one, but also that Jesus wasn't just the anointed one, but he died so that they could be saved, to save those uh, which were lost. So therefore, uh, to me, Luke 19.10 could be the theme verse and everything else just kind of rolls around that. Everything before chapter 19 and those verses afterwards. So the key phrase of the book is the Son of Man, as we've already looked. Uh, Luke deals with the humanity of our Lord. Luke uses the term 26 times in his gospel. So, Son of Man, and you would think, okay, what would a doctor look at? Well, a doctor looks at anatomy, and that is the human body. So therefore, you would, you would kind of gather that as he wrote, he would be writing in that manner. Uh, so when you're following through in Luke and you start to look at the miracles and the, some of the signs that were given, uh, you'll see that it's written from a different viewpoint than is that of Matthew. Uh, really different from Mark, and we're going to see again, uh, it's really different from John. So the doctor speaks, much like Dr. John. Thank you. Uh, so some of the things that distinguish Luke from the others, uh, well, Jesus' human dependence upon prayer. For some reason, Luke really concentrates on the prayer life of Jesus. And um, as he's concentrating on that, it gives us an idea that Jesus was a, a, uh, a man of prayer. There are some, because of the instances of prayer that are being used by Christ, uh, that are recorded in the Gospel of Luke, that this Gospel should be called the Gospel of Prayer. Um, it should be called the Gospel of Luke, but I can understand because prayer is such an important part to Luke and it must have made such an impact as he was hearing these words from Paul and, and uh, from others that he ran in contact with, uh, Peter. And, but anyhow, helped him to understand and so when he writes, he writes on prayer uh, specifically. Uh, he also writes uh, about uh, people and uh, the gospel is, is filled with people, but it's also filled with all these things on prayer. So I think, yeah, I, I gave you a little listing of some of the prayers that you can find. Now, some of them are just one-word prayers. And by the way, haven't we all issued one or two or three-word prayers in our life? You know, Lord, help me, or whatever it may be. Uh, well, we kind of see that in this list. So in Luke chapter 3, uh, Jesus also was baptizing and praying. So while he was going through this thing, he was worshiping as people were being baptized, and he was praying. Uh, Luke 5, 6, he withdrew and prayed. Uh, 6, 12, he continued all night in prayer to God. 9, 18, he was alone praying. So I think you get the idea. You can read that list, 
and it will help you. I think there's also a, a, an important part here that not only did Luke include the times that Jesus was praying, but also he included five or six of his teachings on prayer and how important it was that for Jesus to get that word out that people need to be a people of prayer. Um, so let me pause here just for a moment. The, the least attended meeting in any church is a prayer meeting. And I think that's because we've lost what the, the ideal of prayer meeting is all about. We, we come with our list of who's sick and, uh, and uh, a few needs, but we rarely come and just bow our heads before God and just thank Him for who He is and, and uh, praise Him. Uh, have a real worship service over prayer. I think if that would happen, our prayer meetings would just in, in, in become large and huge because we're not just getting to the, please God fix this, we're getting into the real realm of prayer. And by the way, the real realm of prayer is a conversation with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and through uh, and to God. So uh, that should be something that is always on our mind. Well, Luke here picked that up. And so therefore, Luke writes many things in here about prayer. Anyhow, it's fun as you go through your scriptures to just kind of highlight those areas of prayer and just write on the side, prayer, prayer, prayer. So as you go back through in a couple of years and you are looking at the book of Luke, or maybe in the next few weeks, uh, you'll, be, you'll be encouraged by the number of times that Luke writes that Jesus prayed and or taught on praying. He also gives us a nice uh, focus, if you will, on the Holy Spirit. Uh, he actually quotes or speaks to the Holy Spirit more than Matthew and Mark together. Uh, and you would kind of recognize that, I think, a little bit. Uh, remember, Matthew was writing to the Jewish mind to show that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, uh, and remember, the Jews were filled with basically three different groups. And one of those groups didn't even believe in an afterlife or angels. Um, so he didn't speak a lot about the Holy Spirit. He did, of course, but not a lot. Uh, Mark, very little, but when we get into Luke, uh, it's, it's, in, it's ingrained throughout all of his writing how many times he mentions the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, and anyhow, you'll be able to get to see that. Um, so anyhow, thank you very much for being in our study tonight. It's a little shorter, uh, so you get a little bit more time to, to be with your family, and I thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.